this was unprecedented what happened with winter storm Yuri. So, and, and it was a, it was a question then that, that came from, from our, uh, the president of our division at the time. He's like, I want the playbook. We need yeah. the playbook for what, you know, for anything that happened. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, LFH IQ. Each industry has its own nuances. Chemicals industry is particularly very challenging because of its supply chain issues. The black swan events such as winter storm or macroeconomic changes can shake any model regardless of how sophisticated it might be. But the more information you have about your operations, regardless of whether internal or external supply chain, the more prepared you are likely to be with such events. And even if you are not prepared, the data will help you create the playbook and minimize the risks caused by these disruptions. In today's episode, our guest, Beth Schlett, discusses the supply chain issues of the chemical industry. She shares several stories of recent disruptions and what supply chain leaders need to do to plan the risks. Finally, she shares her insights into how to plan for data governance in larger organizations and why companies must invest in modern technologies such as AI and machine learning. Let me introduce Beth to you. Beth Schlett is a senior supply chain planning and innovation marketing leader, recognized for leading organizations to create value and achieve business goals through her exceptional global cross-functional collaborative style. With 30 plus years experience across industrial chemicals and process automation industries, She most recently served as VP of Global Supply Chain Planning and Order to Cash for the $2 billion chemical technology business of Champion X, focusing on the key elements of transformation, people, process, and technology. She navigated multiple black swan events while building a global planning function and successfully reducing inventory by 18 day on hand, increasing forecasting accuracy by 11% and improved customer service level by 2%. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, Beth. Welcome to the show. Hi, Sam. How are you doing? It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm doing wonderful and I'm super excited to have you because the kind of stories that you have with the depth of supply chain planning, that's always fascinating topic for me in general. I understand for me too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it could be fun, right? Especially uh, you have been doing this for a long time and there's just so much you can do, I guess. You know, you can never be done with supply chain planning. There's always going to be learning the data, etc. <laughs> Absolutely. 100% agree. So just to kick things off, do you want to start with a quick intro if my audience uh, may not know you and uh, your current focus, Beth? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So again, Sam, thank you for having me. Um, I have been, uh, gosh, I, my career has spanned over 30 years. Uh, we just kind of go back to the very beginning. I grew up in the Northeast of uh, United States in a suburb of Philadelphia. Huh. I went to school at Villanova University where I got a chemical engineering degree. I have never been a chemical engineer, never practiced as a chemical engineer, but it was a great foundation for um, for a wonderful career. Uh, I spent the first part of um, first half of my career primarily in sales and marketing. 
So not supply chain, sales and marketing for process automation and controls for companies like Honeywell, ABB, Emerson Process. And um, I actually did that for quite a while. And then I, I took a break. I call it my first retirement. And I, I, I went out and did a little entrepreneurial so I can, yep. I mean, you're doing phenomenal. So I can, you know, definitely think it's awesome what you're doing and, and can relate there and doing my own thing. But I found my way back to corporate and the second half of my career um, has been in corporate and it's been a combination of marketing and supply chain. Uh, most recently, I was vice president of global supply chain planning and order to cash at Champion X, which is uh, an energy, um, energy focused business. And I had an opportunity uh, that I took and I retired at the end of last year. And so now I am enjoying uh, a little bit less hectic of a lifestyle uh, while also doing consulting. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great time. Okay, very interesting. And we have a lot of, uh, you know, commonalities here. Uh, you know, I am the electrical engineer and never practiced. <laughs> so that's going to be common. And I think we can discuss that as well. How does uh, chemical um, engineering differ, uh, you know, from the from the electrical? Um, as well as very interesting journey overall. I think you have had a lot of uh, entrepreneurial um, venture there and then uh, finally landed up in corporate. Uh, I think we are going to be discussing, since you have analyzed the supply chain planning in uh, different industries. So, you know, it'll be interesting to sort of touch on those, how the supply chain planning differ from different industries. But before we dig into all of that, we have one of these standard questions that we ask every single guest, okay? And yeah. that is going to be, Beth, your perspective on business growth. That is a huge question, Sam. It's really huge. And and I, uh, when I first you know read it and then you and I talked about it, I thought, how do you answer that? Uh, but I like it because it is wide open. Yeah. And my perspective on business growth, and it certainly has been formed over the last several years around supply chain. Supply chain has traditionally been thought of, right? It's a cost center. How do you get your costs down? How do you, you know, reduce your costs, reduce your costs, reduce your costs? Um, and sure, right? You definitely, like, what's your, you know, lowest cost to serve? Um, but it's such a valuable piece of the business. How can corporations use the supply chain as a growth engine, right? It can be a huge differentiator. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit, you know, later from the, you know, the type of business that I was in, but we were, I mean, without the supply chain, the business couldn't run. I mean, it was all about supply assurance. That was, I mean, that was a key differentiator for the business that I was in. So that supply chain really is used to help fuel that growth. And how do you showcase that with customers? So it's yeah. not just the afterthought when, oh, is my stuff going to be late? Oh, where are you going to be shipping it from? So when I think about growth, I think there's a huge opportunity for corporations of all sizes to really embrace the supply chain as part of that growth me message, part of the strategy on attaining and retaining and delighting customers. Yeah, could not agree more. I mean, supply chain, it's just so deep and so wide and you can do so many different things. And definitely it should not be thought of as the, because it's really a growth center. Okay, so one of the things that I want you to clarify is going to be supply assurance, okay? I don't think, I mean, we have done a lot of episodes and I don't think anybody has ever mentioned. Um, and I don't know if this is derived from Things such as quality assurance because assurance word come from there so i don't mm -hmm. know if the and i don't know if this is more of a generalized term so do you want to touch on this a little bit you know where is it coming from um and what's the intent yeah some, some more yeah uh, yeah absolutely so in um the business you know my the business that i have spent the last 15 years in we provided specialty chemicals for oil and gas, for energy businesses. So you think about the um, uh, independent oil companies, right? So your international oil company, you're talking about ExxonMobil, you're talking about BP, Chevron, Shell, or you talk about national oil companies, yep. PDVSA, Ecopetrol. Um, they are producing 
energy, right? They are producing oil and gas, and they're doing that every day. And when you think about, okay, what's oil running today? I don't know, $80, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, average about $80 a barrel. Yeah. So for every barrel that comes out of the ground, that's $80 that they either make yep. or they don't make. And if you think about, so for example, um, in the Permian Basin, so if you're familiar at all with, with oil and gas and energy and, um, and unconventional, the, the, the Permian Basin is in Texas, and it's a very high producing energy uh, area. All the major producers are there. ExxonMobil produces 500, 600,000 barrels a day. And so if you multiply that by $80, you're at almost $50 million a day, right? Yeah, Just yeah. from that, that location. So they need, in order that the, the energy companies need certain chemistries to be able to produce, and they have to be able to rely on their suppliers and hence the supply chain of those suppliers so that they can produce and they can get $80 out of there for every barrel that's being produced. So that supply assurance is that is giving that the producer, the customer, yep. a surety, a confidence that what they need, they are going to get from you so that they are able to do their job, which is to produce energy for the world. So that's that's uh, supply assurance, basically, at a very high, you know, high level in the context of energy. Yeah, so very interesting. And not every single listener is going to be familiar with the energy industry as well as these concepts. So obviously, any more description is going to be helpful in general. So here, I'm going to touch on some more points. And then if you have any sort of build up from your previous conversation, sure. um, you can do that. So number one term, independent, okay? And I don't know how many people are going to be familiar with the oil in, in general. So maybe uh -huh. describe a little bit more on the value chain. How does the independent aspect of the oil industry works, who are they independent from? Independent from yeah. government? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're saying independent international. So yes, inter yeah, they're not uh, government owned. So okay. um, like, so for example, Echo Patrol is the national oil company of Colombia. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, obviously Russia has national oil companies, Brazil, Mexico, you may have heard of them. Pemex, P-E-M-E-X, that is yeah. the national oil company of Mexico. And while there may be independent operators there, overall, they are the primary energy company within a, a particular country. Yeah, so very interesting. So now the next uh, layer that I want to touch on, make or don't make, and maybe uh, you want to provide a little bit colors there in terms of what could go wrong when they are not going to make that $80 a barrel. And I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be related to the whole supply chain. If you're not able to provide, sure. uh, then that's probably the opportunity cost. I don't know if I'm reading. Yeah, sure. So um, here's here's um, a couple of examples. Um, when you produce, when when um, they drill, right? There's drilling done and there's there's everybody thinks there's oil coming up. Well, there yeah. is, but there's three things. There's oil, gas, and water. Yeah. And that they they mix, and so the oil and water will form an emulsion. Yeah. And really, you don't want the emulsion. You got to break that apart, right? Because so you, you know, the water will go one way, and they the water is reused in certain ways, and then the oil, right? That's what yeah. right they're they're um, going to produce the energy from. So there's technologies that are provided, chemical technologies to help break that emulsion. Yeah. And if that emulsion is not effectively broken so that you don't separate the oil from the, the water, then they don't get as much money for what they are selling. Because if there's too high of a content of water yeah. and other elements in that mixture, yeah. then they're not going to make as much. They won't make that maybe that full $80, right? They would get paid less because that the purity of what they are pumping is not being passed on then to, to their customer. So a company, a, a specialty chemical producer in that case, then has to find the, identify what is the exact right solution or chemistry to provide to them so that they can produce, they break that emulsion. 
Um, there's a lot of other things that come out of uh, besides like with that are in the oil. There can be wax, paraffin, yep. there's scale. And that builds up on the inside, potentially builds up on the inside of a, you know, what they're pumping through that pipeline. And they need solutions to help clean that. And uh, so that they get product max, they maximize the production that's flowing through the pipes. They're not getting scaled, scaled down. And so it's those types of chemistries then that they use to help clean the pipes, to help ensure that the emulsion is broken and that they're able to break away, break apart the water, uh, the oil. And then of course the gas, right? The gas is another, um, is another sellable, highly sellable product. Yeah. So very interesting insights there. So I'm going to break down something there and then you can probably explain a little bit more um, there. And obviously that, that is going to be helpful for uh, listeners as well if they might not be familiar with the number one, the chemical process, and then how does that translate in supply chain? Supply chain. Uh, because mm-hmm. obviously, you know, there are going to be a lot of different vendors involved and I don't know how easy this process is. But the the whole process does seem like very complicated. The way yeah. the and I don't know how the chemical identification works. Yeah, yeah. So let me also just you know talk about the the supply chain, and then we can you know we can get to the planning of it as well. Yeah. Um, and then and I know right, you have a lot of uh, with your background with ERP and everything. Yeah. Like how does it all? I mean, it, it absolutely all ties together. Yeah. Um, perhaps you're familiar when you you see pictures of um, for energy that there's these platforms, big platforms that are floating out in whether it's the North Sea or if it's in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Um, the the chemistry so has to get from a plant, say it's in yeah. Texas, right? It's yeah. somewhere in Texas. So it has to get from that plant, it gets loaded up into a truck. It has to get trucked then to a port location okay. because it's going to have to go offshore gets trucked to a port location, it then has to go onto some type of vessel, a boat, yeah. right? So you've gone from your plant, you've driven a truck to get yeah. it to the port. From the port, it gets on the boat, then it goes out to the out to the platform, and it has to be then brought up onto the platform. Okay. It could be in what is known, you know, it could be a 275 gallon container. It could be a, you know, thousand gallon container it has to be brought yeah. up onto that platform. Yeah. And then it has to be connected so that it can pump. And when it gets pumped, it gets pumped down what is called an umbilical that okay. is like it's millimeter, mil- like it's so small. Wow. So and you have to pump the chemistry down and it goes miles wow. and miles wow. before then it finally gets to that location where it's being right consumed and used yeah. and it can break that emulsion or ensure that the scale isn't forming or inhibiting the paraffin. So think about that supply chain. It's it's phenomenal. Yeah. And the, the technology, right? It's not just, you know, driving a chemical. Yeah. The 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 technology behind one, the, the chemistry, two, how do you Get it there. Think of the great minds. Here's two engineers, an electrical engineer and a chemical engineer. You need mechanical engineers. I mean, some of the brightest minds to be able to figure yeah. this out, how you're going to you do that. So um, as you can probably tell, one, I'm excited about the supply chain because to me, like when I first learned about it, I'm like, they do what? We have, we <laughs> exactly. have, to, do, we have to do what? And, and how much do you need? Yeah. And when do we need to get it there? And oh, by the way, you know, those boats only go once or twice a week. And if you miss that boat yep. and you can't get it out there until the following week and yep. they didn't plan appropriately. Yeah. If they were to run out, then they're not going to be able to produce. And then there goes that eighty dollars a barrel that we were talking about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about eighty dollars. <laughs> yeah. Or a hundred or whatever, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Wherever, I know. Wherever, 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 wherever it's at, but right, it, it comes, you know, and, and it's really, yes, it's not all, and I do just want to say, you know, yeah, yeah. energy, is, energy, right, has a, is getting a lot of press lately. Obviously, you know, it, it is a money maker, but it, energy makes the world go round, right? I yeah, mean, I know. Yeah. energy, and it yeah. is such an exciting time. Yeah. To, I think about, you know, to, to be part of a supply chain, I think in probably any businesses it can be frustrating, but it's super exciting right now. Yeah. And so if you're in the energy space and you're creative and you want to be innovative and you want to solve complex problems, yeah. boy, you put those two, you put those two together and it's, it's pretty powerful. 
Yeah, it does sound like. And maybe this is the right time to bring on some of these stories and the challenges, because now we have a little context here in terms of how the processes of the chemical industry is going to work and the oil industry is going to work. Um, so maybe let's touch on some of these stories and that will give us the real colors of the real challenges in this industry. You know, what can go wrong? I mean, sure, <laughs> it does sound like, you know what, uh, this may be doable. But unless we hear the real stories where things go wrong, uh, is where yeah. the real insight is going to be. So do you want to share mm-hmm. uh, any of these stories that you may have from your experience? Yeah, planning? sure, <laughs> sure. I, you know, I can share um, a couple. You know, obviously, the, the last few years, the one of the, the biggest disruptions, you know, globally, not huh? one of the biggest disruption, certainly was COVID, right? I mean, that yes. struck everyone. And that's when the world said, supply chain? Right. It's, <laughs> you know, before nobody even knew what supply chain was unless you were in it. Right. Unless you worked in it. And, and with COVID, then everybody started to learn about what supply chain was, or at least what they thought it was. Yeah. That. So. So absolutely. We all dealt with that disruption in some way, personally and in whatever yeah. industry that you were in. Yeah. There is another very significant you want to say, you know, black swan or significant disruption to the supply chain, certainly for the chemical supply chain and and energy, which was in 2021, was, it was called Winter Storm URI, URI. And some people may have recalled it, majority of people probably didn't even realize the full impact, but it's when Texas froze. Yeah. Remember you were seeing those frozen windows and, and all of that. I mean, we were below, you know, below freezing for five days. And I say we, because I lived in, I lived in Texas at the time, yep. um, working in, working in this industry. We froze for five days and plants, when I say plants, so chemical plants that are on the Gulf Coast are not designed for that type of extensive freezing. Yes, you heat trace the pipes, all this, you know, but, but for that type of froze. So not only did, were people cold in their homes and people's homes pipes were bursting, yeah. but these chemical plants across the Gulf Coast, which really is the, you know, one of the largest chemical producing areas in the world and yeah. it supplies the world, right? Not just energy, but the world. We had at the, the company that I was at, I mean, we had over 1,700, you think of this, and we had, you know, multiple plants in, in the region, yeah. almost 2,000 pipes burst, leak, frozen, sensors not working, which means then you can't run. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and we weren't the only one. But what really allowed us to get through all of that, and it was an extensive period of time, like, okay, just because the state thawed out didn't yeah. mean, okay, we're back up and running. All that had to be fixed. But those customers were waiting for their juice, right? They were waiting for their stuff so that they could produce. And when when their inventory started dropping, yeah, right, their inventory is going, and we're saying, well, how are we going to get this? Where are we going to get? You know, where are we going to get this? It yeah. was, um, you know, it was it was all hands on deck, obviously, as yeah. in, you know, when these types of things occur, Always all hands is. on deck, <laughs> abs- you know, absolutely is, and that's one of the things about you know planners, we right, we're, exactly. we like to be heroes, we like to be heroes, um, and oftentimes we are, but gosh, you got to get out of that, right? I mean, <laughs> it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable to be a hero yep. all yep. the time. But yep. any in, in any case, the you know, you have plants, we have plants that aren't able to operate. Um, but you've got to figure out how you get, you know, how you keep your customers operating. Inventory, you know, you you, you say, Well, gee, it's a good thing we had inventory. It was a good thing we had inventory, but at the time, like before that, we're gone. Do we have too much inventory? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's how it goes, right? Yeah, why are we, right? Why are we why do we have this much inventory on yeah. hand? Yeah. You know, and, and 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 it's you know, with planning and other it's it's finding that what is that right balance. But we learned a lot during that period. We had processes in place, and that's what yeah. is important, right? You got you have certain processes in place, but when you have those um those types of events, it it right, you're pressurized and you find where you know where things work, where they don't work. Um, everybody wanted to know what was going on every single minute. And, you know, for anyone, depending upon where you are, how robust your processes are, how robust your planning processes, how how robust your systems are, you know, you may or may not have the data at any, at any, you know, every single moment, but the expectation is these days that, that you have it, right. That the information is right 
there. It's at your tips, fingertips. We were having, you know, every morning at seven o'clock, we got together with the executive team and they wanted to know, okay, how are we doing? Yeah, exactly. Did you get, I don't know. I'm still trying to collect the data. Yep. So, so the amazing people, those amazing planners that were doing so much on spreadsheets did the best yep. that they could. Yeah. Um, but, but really, you know, learning during that period that how critically important the data is, how critically important the processes are and the, and the tools and the talent that you have. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yes. You know, you can have a lot of heroes, yeah. which, which we all love heroes, but you really want those talented heroes that know what they're doing, that, you know, when the pressure's on, yeah. they, they understand, they understand what a supply plan is. They understand how, how to manage their inventory. They, they understand where they can do substitutions and, and yeah. where they can. So those people so are just so, so important in, in investing in their capabilities yeah. and the tools that they have and the tools that they use and, and giving them the confidence that they've got this, right? Because they're reporting all the way up to the top <laughs> dogs. <laughs> That could be a tough job. (laughs) Every day. (laughs) Yeah, I know. So let's touch on this a little bit, okay? So number one, I don't know whether I told you this or not. Before I moved to Toronto, I lived in Texas for roughly 15, 20 years. And I don't know how many people know this or not. And you call this Black Swan event. And Texas is not known for freezing. But Texas does freeze a lot. I remember driving at like two miles per hour. Can you believe this? Two <laughs> miles per hour on three days for like three hours. Okay. <laughs> it gets that crazy in Texas. So yes. now when you look at planning, okay, so mm-hmm. I don't know how planable is the term that I'm going to use, I guess. Uh, this event is going to be in Texas because Texas, and I don't know if this is really recent, I at least have seen this in last, I've not been there for like eight years, I guess. Uh, but before that, I was there for like 15, 20 years, right? So in that duration, I would say at least every other year, Texas used to freeze. So I don't know if this was worse event than that. And can you do in planning around these events? Because see, if you're only going to look at the outliers, I don't know if any system or data can help you planning around outliers. I just don't know how to plan around that, okay? So I don't know if you're going to have any sort of insight there in terms of, okay, is this a true outlier? Can we plan around that? Can we create processes around these things so that, I mean, we don't have to face this again, but if you plan too much, then obviously you are probably storing inventory too much. What if it doesn't happen? Right, (laughs) right, right. right. That's a great, it's a great insight and a great question, um, kind of all all wrapped up together, Sam. So um, you're right. I mean, you do get freezing every couple of years, whether it's in Dallas or, you know, it, yeah. once in once in a while in Houston. Um, this was a this was unprecedented. What had what what happened um, with winter storm Yuri. So and, and it was a it was a question then that that came from from our uh, the president of our division at the time. He's like, I want the playbook. We need yeah. the playbook for what you know for anything that happens. And 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 you know we kind of joked it's like okay you're gonna take it off you know take it off the shelf but really you do need to have some types of playbooks. And, um, and so one thing that also always happens in, um, in, in Texas and on the Gulf Coast, other parts of the world that are, are prone to it are hurricanes. Every year there's going to be hurricanes. Yep. Some seasons are going to be worse than others. So having, you know, the basic, uh, you know, here's what we're going to do. When, like we know, you know, and, and any business, right? You'll, you have certain things that would be at potential higher risk. So do you keep inventory? What level do you keep them at? Do you have alternative locations to produce? So for example, outside of that, that zone. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the company that I was with, we actually had production in Singapore. Yeah. And so that what, which may seem like what it, I mean, strategically excellent move. That decision was made several years ago and it absolutely helped in situations like this. But getting back to, you know, how can you how can you plan every single scenario? You yeah. can't. Um, but having your basic processes on when an, an event may occur, like a hurricane or a freeze or, or whatever that is. Um, but there are 
new systems and new tools that are that are out there now that and especially with all with the artificial intelligence and with yep. the machine learning that are are enhancing that scenario planning yep yep and and allow you to okay well what if this what if that and and some of them are in like that shorter time frame right you yep. can do that that short, you know, hey, what if this happens this week or next week? And then you can be looking at those longer horizons a year or two years out. Um, and there, there's some great tools and systems that are out there that are starting to allow planners um, to be able to do that. And of course, they're investments. I mean, yeah. they are, you know, you look at the O9s, you look at the Canaxes, um, the Blue Yonders, yeah. they're, you know, O9 with the digital brain. They're, those are the types of systems and tools that are becoming available to allow allow planners and supply chains and, and not just like a supply chain team, but it's the business teams. You know, you talk about the CFOs and the COOs, yep. the CSCOs to really do a collaborative yep. type of scenario plan on what what ifs. And those tools are um, I mean, they're they're out there. Yeah, exactly. Could not agree more. I mean, obviously, the technology is out there, but it also depends upon the quality of your processes. And I think that's the point that you have been trying to make, that even if these guys can get quality data from outside, uh, you know, if your data is not going to be of quality, then obviously the insights that you are going to get are not going to be of quality either. And you are making decisions and planning based on that. So we yeah. are going to touch a little bit, uh, you know, from the system and the processes perspective, there is a tremendous confusion in general in the market in terms of where you sort of draw the boundary between different systems and, and the processes. So the systems that you mentioned, O9s of the world, the Blue Yonder of the world, uh, as well as Connexus, I guess that is the third one that you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. you know, great, amazing tools out there, right? There are three different areas, I guess, overall from the data perspective, from the supply chain perspective. One is going to be inside the boundary of your company, okay? That is one sort of, uh, you know, supply chain that you need to manage. But then you also mentioned after you sort of cross the boundary of your four walls, then that's another problem that you have in general. So when you look at the four walls of the boundary, then, you know, uh, ERP systems are great. I mean, that's how the ERP systems are known. For. But they are not necessarily good for your managing the external supply chain, hosting the external data, uh, planning around that external data. These tools are great. I mean, they can manage both of those, but they are not necessarily the replacement for your sort of the internal uh, processes. And I don't know if you have any sort of insights there in terms of what you think, how do you sort of draw the boundary between different um, systems and processes and how they should be managed and hosted. Any any insight there by any chance? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet. Exactly, exactly. That's <laughs> I, a great I, really I love it. I, um, because each enterprise, each organization is is different. different. I mean, yep. you could have right. You could have someone who's running an SAP or yep. an Oracle ERP system, and they're doing all their planning on Excel spreadsheets. I mean, the world is planned on Excel, right? Yeah. So, so how do you how do you draw that line there, right? Yeah. Where where is the your data, your uh, your master data, your operational yeah. data? Where where is that housed, and who owns it? There's you know you, you talk about like you know drawing the lines. I, I was involved years back. We were we were embarking on master data cleanup. Yeah. And it was being led by IT. Yeah. Great. The business didn't care. Our finance team didn't care. Yeah. The supply chain team didn't care. They went, that's not my problem. That's IT. It's not IT's problem. It's <laughs> right. It's it's who, you know, who's using the data, right? There's certain data that is certainly supply chain master data, that is certainly planning master data, that is finance master data, that's customer master data. And then and but it's shared. Yep. So yep. so I I think one of the really one of the most important things to do. And I, I don't, I don't, I mean, some companies do it, some companies don't, but what is, you know, the data strategy? There needs to be, some, you know, some, you know, somewhere how's the data strategy. And then whether you have a COE yeah. that's, that's managing that, or you say, okay, maybe there's going to be that, 
really kind of central will get it started, but each part of the business, like, you know, the supply chain planning, you own your master data. Yeah. Manufacturing, you own yours. Finance, you own yours, but within these confines of these rules. And then there has to be, you know, how is it regularly being um, maintained and cleaned, et cetera. Yeah. So that regardless of the system, then you're, I, I think then that, that uh, you know, who owns what, the, the, the data, who owns the data and who is responsible for it is, is absolutely key so that these systems then can work together and the functions can work together. Yeah, could not agree more. And, uh, you know, whenever you are going to have this question, who owns it, typically nobody ends up owning it and nobody wants to own it. Nobody wants to get into these cross-functional issues. The only team that really gets into the cross-functional issues is going to be IT because they are not doing anything for themselves, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have a good IT, you know, I, I mean, we, uh, having good IT business partners, right? I mean, just, you know, having that, that uh, you know, small group or one or two individuals within IT that relate to the, the different functions in the business and can impart, you know, the value and the importance that then hopefully then the functions start to take it on. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think this, this conversation, and I like to, uh, you know, mention an analogy, okay? So when you look at this problem from the business perspective, it's almost like, okay, I want really nice dinner, okay? Um, I can point out complaints about, okay, maybe this thing is not nice. Maybe this thing is, I don't like this one. I don't like that. I don't like this, okay? But then the, the cook is cooking the dinner and cook is telling you that, okay, this is how the process is supposed to work. This is the cut that I need to make so that you can get that taste, uh, you know? So people are not interested. No, no, no. Don't tell me all of that. Okay. <laughs> Just give me the dinner that I like. Okay. There is a process to it. Okay. So that's where the cross functional alignment, and I don't know. I mean, the kind of the organization and the size of the organizations that you work with, obviously, they are humongous. And bringing everybody on the same page, <laughs> it's a Herculean task, I guess, right? But the master yeah. data, I think the master data comment that you were mentioning. If you are not aligned there, I guess, and I don't know what you have done, maybe you, if you have any other insights in terms of mm -hmm. what would be your approach, let's say, if you are consulting with somebody. Uh, and now it is your job to bring that cross-functional alignment. It could be a fun project, yeah. by the way, okay? If you have to do this, what would you do differently? Yeah, yeah. So a couple things. One, I think, you know, we're, obviously, if we're talking about supply chain or talking about master data. Um, Both are sort of interrelated data, in, in any, my mind. In, yeah, in any. One a, a a champion yeah in the organization at the right level right it it can't be not that it can't be but it, it becomes very difficult if yeah. you don't have someone if you know if, whether it's the you know the c level or it's yeah. the senior you know the, the most senior level of your leadership team yeah. that has a, a vested interest and they really believe in it and they are going to support you know su su support the team to do that Two, we, I, you know, I say support the team. I really believe in the uh, the concept of a, a COE, a center yeah, of excellence. I agree. Um, and and establishing that now, yeah. whether the center of excellence is truly a center, a group of people that, yeah. and I'm going to say sit together because not everybody sits together <laughs> anymore because we're all, you know, you know, virtually. Yeah, but, yeah. But, you know what I mean? That that are that are all, you know, together under that COE. Or if they are more of a, um, uh, I'll say, you know, a, a virtual where, yes, they're they're aligned with the COE or that's part of their responsibility, but they sit in a function. Yep. Then that, you know, those two things are, I, I think, really, really important. Having that senior uh, support person, that advocate, that sponsor. Yeah. And then establishing a center of excellence. And that center of excellence, you know, can't just be a name only. Um, it really, you know, you got to have, you know, I, I think it's important to have the right level of, of person. You know, you just put it, you say, okay, we're going to start this center of excellence. We're putting a junior person. No, yeah. you know, you need someone with some seniority, right? Yeah. That, that, you know, very senior manager or director, and it's an opportunity for growth, right? Yeah. So, we, you know, I mentioned about people and how important they are. I am a strong proponent. I mean, for me, Maybe sometimes to a fault, people are always like at the center of my universe that, yeah. 
you know, so we think about like the COE, um, I mean, these are, these are great for they people, are. right? Yeah. You get your, you know, you get your people that are your, your future leaders. They're passionate about what they do. You see them, you know, growing in the future. And yep. then also to be part of that COE becomes a destination because then you're starting to get your best talent that's excited about solving that problem. They, they love data. They love supply chain. They, they love what they do. They want to make a difference. They, they're, they're looking at that final outcome on how they're yep. creating value for the company and creating value for the customer. So, you know, though, I think, again, you know, just kind of like coming back, you know, to your question, what would be, you know, the key things, getting that senior advocate sponsor, establishing a, a center of excellence that's yep. focused on that particular area. And again, how you set that up all, you know, all together as one, you know, solid organization, or if it's, you know, out in the, out amongst the, you know, the rest of the functions and it's kind of dotted line responsible in, and then they have a very clear charter um, of what it is they're trying to, to accomplish. Yeah, could not agree more. Great insights. And I think we can go on for hours. Uh, you are so insightful. <laughs> but <laughs> Obviously, we need to limit this in like 40, 45 minutes. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, episode we typically do. Yeah. So do you have any sort of last minute closing thoughts, advice for our listeners? Uh, yeah, I kind of, I'll, I'll go back to your second question there was, you know, what are my thoughts on growth? Yeah. And I would, you know, encourage all organizations you know, regardless of, of size, doesn't have to be multi, multi-billion, you know, but, but really think about that your supply chain, because without yeah. your supply, you know, the, the customers aren't going to get what they want. And so how are you going to grow? So we talked about collaboration, cross-functional collaboration, exactly. really getting, you know, getting to know what the other parts of the organization do yeah. so that when the salesperson or the sales team or the executive team is out there talking to these customers, they, they understand what yep. it takes and they're, and they're bringing along their supply chain partners or in some cases, maybe they're bringing their IT, their IT partners. And, 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 you know, and how do you build that collab, that cross collaboration and understanding, you know, we talked about talent. How do you bring talent from different functions, exactly. bring them over for a little bit of time, spend some time in, spend some time in supply chain. Spend some time in sales, spend some yep. time in marketing, and yep. then you go back to what you love, yep. but you've walked in someone else's shoes. And then when you're thinking about what could I do to create customer value, what could I do to grow, right? You've had that cross-functional collaboration, you work together, and, uh, and, and I really do, do believe that the supply chain has a very strategic role to play in, in growth for just about any company. Okay, amazing insights there. So I'm going to summarize some of the quick personal takeaway from for my listeners as well. Uh, number one, build your COE. Number two, do that cross-functional um, alignment. Uh, but if you are really looking to get results overall from the supply chain perspective, then you have to get your foundation right. On that note, Beth, uh, really enjoyed talking to you. This has been a fascinating episode. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. I, I enjoyed the conversation too. And uh, you have a great rest of the day. Thanks. You too, Beth. Thank you so much. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Beth, connect with her on LinkedIn for more about supply chain planning transformation, SNOP and collaborative cross-functional leadership. You can find her by looking up Beth Schlett, it's B-E-T-H-S-C-H-L-I-T-T -T on LinkedIn. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.